Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Julian Kennedy, President and CEO for the California Hispanic Chambers of Commerce. I want to thank all of you for joining today's Elevate series. With our, along with our partners at Southern California Edison, we will be discussing business resiliency and recovery. As many organization, organizations begin to look ahead at the road of recover, to recovery, this webinar session will discuss some of the expectations versus reality and how to maintain resiliency. Most importantly, we will hear from our partners at Southern California Edison and learn more about public safety power shutoffs, uh, PSPs, including resources and access to information to help keep your business agile and competitive. Now at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our partner and our advocate and friend at Southern California Edison, the program manager of Southern California Edison Supplier Diversity and Development uh, Program, Gloria Burton. Gloria? Thank you, Julian. Good morning, everyone. I am Gloria Burton, the program manager at SCE Supplier Diversity and Development. I just wanna say thank you for your virtual presence to learn more about public safety power shutoff known as PSPS and taking a proactive approach to business resiliency and um, preparedness. Again, I wanna thank um, the California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Julian Canete and his great team for hosting this. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Luis Lara is a senior business analyst for the outage communications team within SCE's business customer division, which is known as BCD. His primary role is to support commercial and government customers on escalated outage related issues, as well as educate customers on SCE's wildfire mitigation strategy and public safety power shutoff protocol. Luis began his career with SCE 12 years ago in public affairs and then moved on to BCD. The outage communications team functions as the primary conduit to address outage related inquiries from commercial, government, and internal stakeholders. The outage communications team also operates as SCE's liaison to educate customers on outage processes, multi-phase outage impacts in communities, grid modernization, and how SCE supports statewide operational safety initiatives. Given the team's unique position within SCE, the team has been tasked to oversee BCD's business resiliency program that will help guide and engage SCE's business customer division with emergency operation centers during time of crisis. Take it away, Luis. Thank you very much, Gloria. And again, so my name is Luis Slada. And uh, again, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to join you today uh, to really deliver a lot of important information to our commercial customers, for business customers. Uh, we're very well aware that the pandemic has already, um, you know, leveraged a strike against all of us, uh, particularly our small businesses. So the more we're able to engage one another, uh, open those lines of communication, ensure that we have a proper ebb and flow of information and communication with you, uh, then that will more likely than not ensure our success as a whole, as a community. So again, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to be here. Uh, like Gloria mentioned, I am part of the outage communications team and I will provide some contact information uh, for you at the end of, of, the, of the presentation on how to engage with us, how to reach out to us. So if you have any, any issues with, related, with, related, with respect to any outage events that are going to impact you or that are live outage events, there's a way that you can get, up, get a hold of someone uh, instead of going to the contact center. Okay, so let's go ahead and get going. Let's go ahead and move over to the next slide. Just wanna give you a quick overview of what our, our agenda would look like. Uh, we're gonna cover a little bit on rotating outage events. What does that mean? How would that impact your operations? Uh, we're gonna dive into SE's wildfire mitigation plan and our strategy in that space. We're gonna continue to discuss why preparedness is key to ensuring our overall success, uh, as, as always communication resources and questions. So let's go ahead and move over to the next slide and get going on our rotating outages. Now, rotating outages, what does that even mean? Right? How does that even come about? So if you guys recall last year and the year before we had what's called uh, a de-energizing event where the California independent system operator identified that the available demand, that the demand for power was encroaching or about to exceed available supply. 
In those instances, a California system, an independent system operator will issue a flex alert or a warning. Hey guys, we need to flex our power, shut off you know, uh, energy consumption or reduce ener energy consumption significantly so that we can more evenly uh, distribute uh, electricity and power throughout our communities. When that threshold begins to encroach significantly, then Cal ISO will direct all utilities, including Southern California Edison, to begin dropping load. In other words, to begin de-energizing customers. And there's a process of doing that. Okay, and that's what's called a rotating outage event. And by rotating, it means that we're going to de-energize a certain uh, population or certain customers and then if we need to, if the threat's still there, we'll rotate into the next customer and then into a next. And I'll give you a little more information about that. So in the next slide, let's, let's identify a little bit more about what rotating outages even mean. So everyone is assigned a rotating outage event number, okay? So if you look on your invoice, it'll identify what your rotating outage ID or number looks like, right? It could be A057, right? So that means that you're within that rotating outage group, okay? So let's move over to the next slide. So let's say you already identified your rotating outage group. So what does that mean for you, okay? If you go onto se.com uh, under rotating outages, you'll find out who's next in line, right? We have about 69, 70 something rotating outage groups. So if you're in line uh, or next in line and a rotating outage event occurs, then you will be de-energized for approximately 60 minutes in duration. Okay, once that has subsided, then the next group will come in and they will be de-energized for approximately 60 minutes or so. Uh, the max duration for these rotating outage events is about 60 minutes. But one thing I do wanna highlight to our customers is this type of event has occurred already. In fact, this, uh, this year, Cal ISO has already issued several flex alerts. So what does that mean for your operations? Have you started to incorporate this type of potential impact to your business? If you lose power for an hour, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for your downstream customers? Uh, maybe not just for your business, but what does that mean for you at home? How are you prepared for that type of one hour, no power event? What does that mean for your own uh, constraints at home as well as your businesses? So just to kind of start helping you think and develop that situational awareness capabilities within your own space. Now, within your rotating outage group by D number, most of you will have a rotating uh, outage group by D number that begins with the letter A, which means that it's an automatic type of system. In other words, we're able to de-energize that meter or that section of circuit from a remote location. Some customers have an M, which, which is a manual process. They're, we're eliminating a lot of those, and that will require someone to literally go out there, de-energize the transformers or some full switches. But most of us will fall under an A or an automatic uh, de-energizing type of, uh, of functionality. Now, for those customers, when you look on, on, on your invoice and you see a rotating uh, outage group ID as exempt or N001, what that is telling you is that you are your circuit or the way your circuitry runs to you is so close to an essential service. In other words, a hospital, a police department, fire department, that if we were to de-energize you, it would de-energize those emergency services. So in those instances, your section of that circuit will be exempt from being de-energized during rotating outage events. Now, I wanted to highlight the rotating outage events today because it is a, it's a real issue. It's a real thing that's happening. And considering that Cal ISO has already issued a few flex alerts, in fact, just one yesterday, uh, it's very important that, uh, that we keep this present, that we incorporate this into our business res uh, resiliency plan. So let's get, go ahead and move over to our next slide. Now, I do have quite a few slides to get through. I wanna deliver a lot of information and hopefully information that is very pertinent to you and that is actionable to you. So don't worry, we have about another 800 slides to go through and about 20 minutes left. So let's go ahead and get going. So let's go ahead and start talking about SCE's welfare mitigation plan. Now in 2020, our high fire risk areas uh, experienced record dry fuel levels throughout the year. And most of this was because of you know, high heat spells, lack of precipitation, and a series of more significant uh, Santa Ana winds toward the tail end of the year. In fact, the 2020 wildfire season was the largest in recorded California history, with nearly 10,000 wildfires burning approximately 4.2 million acres, and then unfortunately claimed the lives of 33 Californians. So wildfires and other environmental factors really help underscore the importance of continuing to strengthen the electrical grid to become more resilient, uh, particularly in the face of these extreme weather conditions. 
Along with that comes the fact that we need to ensure that we as a community, as, as a business community, we're able to develop and incorporate those ideas, those processes uh, into our own business resiliency plan and become aware of these threats impacting our own communities and our business environment. Now in 2020, we primarily focus our efforts on circuit segmentation. In other words, instead of de-energizing an entire circuit of about 2,500 customers, we focus on de-energizing a smaller, more tailored section of that de-energize uh, of, of that circuit when the, when the need arose. So in other words, instead of taking down, let's say 2,500 circuits, we were able to focus efforts on maybe 200, 400 customers, whatever the conditions at the time dictated. Now, through these segmentation efforts and a lot of grid hardening efforts that have been going on over the last several years, we have now been able to successfully remove approximately 25,000 customers from ever coming under PSPS scope consideration ever again. So we're moving the needle in the, in the right direction and we're moving in the correct direction. Now, in fact, the largest PSPS event in 2020 had approximately 25% fewer customers de-energized than the largest event in 2019. So again, the needle is, is pointing that we're moving in the, in the correct direction. Now, I wanna level set with you. Uh, SCE will continue to use the PSPS protocol as a measure of last resort when the conditions exist uh, that would prevent an elevated threat to our communities. Now, while approximately 220 of our 1100 high fire risk area circuits have experienced at least one PSPS de-energizing event, we have found that 72 circuits have experienced four or more de-energizing events since approximately 2019. Our near-term grid hardening efforts will be focused around those 72 circuits. Now, it's not that we don't care about all the other circuits, but we do believe that in hardening those particular circuits, those co communities that have been impacted the most, we will be able to help those communities that have experienced the greatest or the most de-energizing events. Now, in my next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about our uh, PSPS notifications. As a business customer, you know that communication is extremely important. So Edison, we've kind of taken a step back with our own PSPS notification processes, and we've initiated an end-to-end -end analysis of what is working and what really is not working, right? We start to reach out to customers. Listen, we send out these communications. Does this communicate what we are intending to communicate to you, right? So um, as of uh, June and uh, moving into July, we have new, uh, new verbiage, uh, new information that will be coming out to our customers during PSPS events. So please be on the lookout for that. We're looking to make our information a lot more uh, easier to understand, easier to receive and to process for our customers, okay? Now, within the PSPS notification process, I wanna highlight one thing for you. Now, in about 2018, we started a zip code PSPS notification opportunity. And what that was intended to do really was uh, we identified that there are certain customers that may not necessarily be the customer of record, if you will, right? So let's say uh, Acme RV Park, right? That's the customer of record. But, you know, John Doe in Space 26 is not necessarily the customer of record. So traditionally, we send all notifications, all emergency notifications to the customer of record. But if you're not the customer record, well, you're not, you're not receiving that information, even emergency information. So the zip code uh, process or notification was created to allow those customers that are not the customer record to receive emergency information, those PSPS notifications. One thing we did find out, uh, found out is that a lot of the customers that were the customer record were also signing up to receive zip code notifications. And there's a bit of a problem there. In fact, there's a lot of confusion that arises from that. When you're the customer of record, we will send specific communications to you that are specific to your circuit, that are specific to your structure. In other words, the transformer that feeds you. It's very specific information. When you sign up to receive zip code notifications, you're signing up to receive any notification that comes on a zip code. The problem with that is that we could have multiple circuits running through one zip code. We can have three or four different circuits through one zip code. So it's very hard to give uh, those customers that are not the customer of record specific information, but the zip code notification is intended to give you a broader view of what is happening in your area. It may not necessarily impact that particular circuit, that particular transformer, but at least it'll give you a greater situational awareness uh, ability of what is happening around you. So if you are the customer of record, we will strongly recommend that you do not sign up to zip code notifications and that you stick with your normal outage notification processes that you receive from Southern California Edison. Now, on the notification front, 
every every uh, every chance that we are activated for a PSPS events, it never fails. We will push out information to our customers, and invariably, a lot of those communications are returned to us as undelivered or undeliverable. It could very well be that the person that used to be the point of contact for Southern California Edison uh, has now moved to a different department, or perhaps they've retired. Or perhaps they hit the lottery and they're sipping on a Mai Tai in, high, in Hawaii or something. Well, that person is not no longer serving as a point of contact. So please don't help us to deliver proper information to those proper channels, those proper contacts within, or within your organization by ensuring that you update your contact information at all times. If there's any change or move or whatever is necessary, I understand Edison's the last person on your mind that you want to engage with. But during emergency events, we, when we need to push on information to you, it's very important that we have your updated contact information at all times. So please help us out with that. Now, in our next slide, let's continue with our PSPS information. Now, this is what I call the meat and potatoes on, you know, what is Edison doing behind the scenes uh, to really reduce the use of these PSPS events, right? These de-energizing events that really impact our customers' operations. So again, simply to reiterate, the PSPS protocol is an effort of last resort when weather and fire conditions demand it, right? When the elevated threats to our communities exist and are present and are likely to materialize in a particular area. Now, and our intent really is never to de-energize our customers. We're not in the business of shutting off power to you. However, there have been occasions where post PSPS event inspections have found toppled trees and damage to our equipment. So had those circuit segments not been de-energized at the appropriate times when those trees had toppled over, for example, then it's quite likely that that windstorm or that whatever event could have graduated into something significantly more serious for that community. Now, although we cannot influence weather or fire conditions, we have identified a pathway to help us really reduce the use of the PSPS uh, protocol while still prioritizing uh, the need to keep our communities safe and, 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 and moving forward. Now, let's talk a little bit about what that entails. So, and this is really a kind of four-step process. First uh, is to really cover what's called a bare wire. In, in other words, install covered conductor. Now, as you're driving down the street, you probably look up and you see these, you know, you see our poles and our wires hanging. And, you know, to me, it's a beautiful thing, right? We're delivering power to our customers. And I get it. It's not the most sightly thing. It's not the most aesthetically pleasing thing. But in those high fire areas, what we're doing is we're removing all of that bare wire and replacing it with covered conductor. In other words, is that wire with a thick plastic sleeve over it. And the reason for that is because during or through these high fire risk areas, they're actually more like corridors. Because every year, windstorms do come through these certain areas, and those lines will start to slap together. And if those lines slap together, those bare wires slap together, well, then that could cause a spark. And if we have dry vegetation nearby, it's been really drying uh, recently, um, then now we have the recipe for a potential ignition point in the field. So replacing all of that bare wire with covered conductor will help significantly reduce of a spark uh, occurring in the field. And again, uh, reducing the likelihood of a potential fire uh, igniting in the field at that time. Now, the second measure is installing automated uh, switching devices or automating existing switching devices. Now, this will allow us uh, to more narrowly isolate certain areas that are experiencing elevated wind speeds. We did begin this effort in 2020, and during most activations, we focus on circuit segments as opposed to de-energizing entire circuits. Now, these first two measures are focused on grid hardening efforts, and our goal is to complete this uh, construction phase by approximately 2021. What does that mean for you? If you live in a high fire risk area, if your business is within a high fire risk area, there is probably, you're likely going to see a uh, more work in that particular area, which means you may be impacted by more outages, more planned maintenance outages in your area. So please prepare for those in advance. We're not looking to annoy you, <clears throat> excuse me, annoy you or disrupt your operations, but we are looking to harden the grid so that when that peak uh, windstorm comes through those particular regions, it's a lot safer to maneuver for our communities. Now, the third measure is to really remove certain circuits or circuit segments from PSPS scope. And this is really based on local changes uh, in environmental conditions. So for example, recent burn scar conditions were not previously factored into our modeling so if the fuel conditions are not conducive for an ignition to occur or for a fire to spread, then we may be able to exempt that portion of the circuit or that entire region from coming under PSPS conditions or protocol. 
Again, now just to level set with you, this would not prevent any unplanned outage events such as vegetation or debris from blowing into our lines and interrupting power. That is always going to be a threat, particularly when we have high, uh, wind storms. However, it would reduce the likelihood of us leveraging a proactive de-energizing PSPS protocol uh, to our customers. Uh, now this process has been completed on our end for removing those circuit segments from <clears throat> excuse me, environmental conditions. Now the fourth me measure is really to add additional weather stations, uh, really to improve our, our situational awareness uh, and field conditions at more locations. Now, uh, we are looking also to deploy mobile weather stations, which will not only uh, allow the, or improve our reading, our weather reading capabilities, but also provide ability to get more accurate live results at very specific, uh, specific and granular locations. Now, all of these expedited grid hardening efforts will be focused on those identified 72 circuits. Uh, again, this does not mean that other circuits will be left behind, but we do believe it is appropriate to focus our efforts on those customers, on those communities that have uh, in that have been impacted the most by PSPS events. Now we are targeting to complete this work in time for our peak 2020, 2021 wildfire season, which is approximately in October and that's fast approaching. So we are continuing to move forward with a lot of this work in the field. So let's go ahead and move over to the next slide. <clears throat> now, you just heard me go through a lot of information on what we're doing, different measures are, what Edison is doing to upgrade our systems and how is that working, right? So. And you're probably wondering right now, okay, so what does that all even mean? Well, here we have a visual representation of that, of what it would look like. So here is the Arlene 16 KB circuit. Now that orange section that you see there, <clears throat> excuse me, represents an overhead uh, section of line, that overhead equipment that's above ground. While the green areas uh, represent circuitry that is underground. Now that green section in the circle represents a neighboring underground circuit. So when elevated weather conditions begin to materialize, our focus is on those orange sections, that overhead circuitry, because that's more likely not where the most uh, uh, threat is likely to materialize for our customers. Now, the quickest way to increase the safety conditions for that community tied to this overhead section is to replace all of the bare wire with covered conductor. That's number one. Now, this will help reduce the likelihood of an ignition point occurring in the field caused by flying debris or toppling trees, et cetera, et cetera. And whenever possible, we are looking to isolate that greatest threat area, that orange section, uh, and perform pre-switching uh, pre procedures to a neighboring circuit uh, that is not within PSPS scope. So in this example, and assuming all conditions being equal, we would have switched over that orange section to that underground green section in that, uh, in that circle there. And all things being equal, these customers would have had three of their four PSPS events eliminated and their one event would have been reduced in duration and customer count significantly. Now, these efforts have been implemented for this uh, our Lean 16 KV circuit. And so moving forward, these, uh, these efforts, these mitigation efforts have been deployed and this community will not likely experience as many PSPS events as they had in the past. Now, in our next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about, about our public safety power shutoff protocol. Now, over time, the measures we discuss will help reduce the size, frequency, duration, and really hopefully the need to even leverage the PSPS protocol. In the meantime, PSPS will remain as a tool to help mitigate wildfire risk uh, when extreme weather conditions materialize. So again, a not often told story is that the fact that SCE crews have found uh, equipment damage and toppled trees and branches and debris tangled up into our equipment during these post in inspection opportunities. So what does that mean for you? For those customers that have a business or that even live within a high fire risk area, please be prepared, please be aware, please continue to uh, grow your own situational awareness capabilities within your own space, within your own operations. This will continue until we're able to get to a spot or a, or a point where we're able to deploy additional mitigating efforts to all of the high fire risk areas. But in the meantime, the public safety power shutoff protocol is gonna be here and will stay and will be leveraged as conditions demanded. Now let's go over to our next slide. I wanna talk a little bit about what are the decision making points that happen behind the scenes. Now this is a common question that I received from many commercial customers is Luis, listen, I get it. It's for safety purposes, but give me more details. What happens? How do you make this decision? So let me give you a couple of pointers here. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I wanna give you some key information that will be uh, pertinent to your own operations. So let's say that the National Weather Service has, has issued a red flag warning for your region, for your community. 
understand that just because the National Weather Service has issued a red flag warning, that does not mean that we're going to shut off power to your business, to your region, to your city. What it does mean, however, is that we are going to focus our attention in that region. Okay. So again, red flag warning does not necessarily equal no power, but it does equal we will focus our attention in that region. What does that mean for you? So let's say it's a Sunday night, you're watching the news, you know, having a cup of coffee, and you hear the, the weather forecasters say, you know, guys, we're looking at extreme winds coming through your region, uh, you know, materializing probably on Wednesday morning, uh, significant winds, et cetera, et cetera. What we're looking to do is to grow that situational awareness capabilities for all of our customers, including our commercial customers, so that when you're sipping on that cup of coffee and you hear that potential wind threat going to impact your region, we want that to trigger something in your mind. What does that mean for you? If we have, um, if we have to leverage the PSPS protocol and we have to de-energize uh, your operations, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for your staff? How do you begin engaging your staff with this potential threat looming about? How do you engage your downstream customers? If you have a deliverable for a customer, how would that impact that deliverable? How do you begin engaging in that space? So again, it's not really to put you in a position, you know, kind of backed up against the wall, if you will, but really is to create that greater awareness of what is happening around you, right? So what would that mean for you? What does that trigger for you? Now, on our end, we do have our own in-house meteorology team and our own in-house fire scientists. Now, our meteorology team, their primary role and responsibility is to sound the alarm when there's a potential threat coming to any region. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be significant winds. It could also be significant heat. It could be uh, rains coming through a recently burned out area. Their primary role is to sound the alarm and say, hey, guys, there's a poten potential threat in this region. We need to begin mobilizing resources and preparing for that potential threat. Now, our fire scientists, these are folks that used to work with different fire agencies throughout the state. They understand the fire process really, really well. They understand the risks that are tied to this. So whenever there is an active fire or a potential for a fire or when weather conditions are live, these folks will be deployed to different regions to lend support and also uh, serve as liaisons between Edison and different fire agencies and cities, uh, different incident commanders at different locations, so we can easily communicate behind the scenes. Now, I get what you're telling me right now. Okay, that's great. I get it at least, but give me more details about what does that mean for me and my business and my home? So let me give you two data points. One, um, 32 mile per hour sustained winds, 47 mile per hour wind gusts. 32 sustained, 47 mile per hour gusts. What does that mean? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that at these lower wind speeds, we're gonna shut up power to your operations or to your region. What it does mean, however, again, is we're gonna focus our attention in that, in that area. And let me tell you why. It's not that our equipment is gonna fail at these lower speeds, but one thing we start seeing at these lower 32 mile per hour sustained winds and 47 gusts, we start to see palm fronds and tree branches start begin to uh, blow about and make contact with overhead equipment. This is when we start to see people's backyard umbrellas and, and easy up start blowing into our overhead equipment. Again, it doesn't mean that our, that our equipment is going to fail, but this is when we start to see more debris to flow about. So it could very well be that you are uh, de-energized or you lose power, not necessarily because we proactively de-energize you, but because someone's backyard umbrella just blew over into overhead, overhead equipment and caused a short and now we have no power. So again, at these lower speeds, we want, again, to encourage you to develop that situational awareness capabilities. If you lose power, not necessarily because we proactively shut off your power, but because debris is blowing around, what does that mean for your operations, right? How do you start incorporating those types of events? Now, we will deploy different field resources to give us more detailed information of what they're seeing in, in the field. And one thing that we are looking to, that we are continuing to do is once we collect all of this information, it's all gathered in our EOC, Emergency Operations Center, and all of this data has to go through a process. In other words, we need to identify if we have to leverage or we need to leverage the PSPS protocol we need to understand what is the demographic makeup of the customers that will be impacted. In other words, how many water wastewater treatment plants will be impacted? Are there any uh, fire departments, police departments, any city or uh, county emergency uh, operations services that will be uh, impacted? What is the scope of impact? Okay. Now here I want to take a little parallel uh, sidestep with you. It's very important for us to have updated contact information during these emergency events. 
Now, let's set aside your commercial, your, your business mind aside. If you have a friend, a family member, neighbor, person down the street, someone that you know that has a heightened medical need for power, for energy, it is very important that we have that person identified in our own system as a medical care or critical care customer. The reason for that is when we begin to push out information to customers and that uh, information has come back as undeliverable, those critical care customers, those medical baseline customers that have a heightened medical need for power, we're going to collect that information. It's going to go over to our consumer affairs team. They're going to make another attempt to reach out to that customer to make sure that they're aware of the potential threat. And if we're still not able to get a hold of them, we're going to deploy a field resource to literally door knock and conduct a wellness check for that customer. So again, I know that this is not necessarily falling under business conversation, but we all have family members. We all know someone that may have a heightened medical need for power. So please help us disseminate that, that information to that person. If they have a heightened medical need for power, please communicate with Edison. There's a simple process to have their account identified as medical based on or critical care. And there's some you know, kind of financial benefits to that. Um, but it is very important during emergency operations that we have those people um, identified in our system, okay? So let's go ahead and move over to our next slide. Now, again, communication is very, very important to our customers. So during these PSPS events and whenever we're activated during these events, we will begin to engage with you as early as possible. We typically begin engaging local government, local tribal governments, um, and those essential service customers, uh, typically about three days out. At about two days out, uh, we are going to begin engaging all of our customers that are likely to be impacted by this uh, potential de-energizing event. And communications will continue to be pushed out on a daily basis. Now, let's say that there are some changing conditions that may require an additional push out of information, then we will do that as, as, as it's required. Now, I wanna highlight two notifications here for you. I know that we're running out of time, so I wanna get to it pretty quickly. The one to four hour imminent shutdown notification. What does that mean for you and your operations? So whenever we have the luxury of time, we're gonna push out this imminent shutdown notification that essentially says, customer, we're looking to de-energize or shut off your power in the next one to four hours, okay? Now, I did qualify this as if we have the luxury of time. What does that mean? So one thing that we have learned from different activations over the several years is that weather is extremely volatile. So let's say that the period of concern uh, is likely to materialize on Saturday morning, 9 a.m. to noon, right? And are we push on information to you, customer, please be prepared. And let's say weather modeling is showing that, yeah, you know what, everything is likely to materialize and the threat is, is gonna be here and impact our customers that Saturday morning. Well, it could be that the afternoon weather report says, hey, no need to wait for Saturday. The threat is here now, right? So weather has deteriorated so much that it is uh, the, the conditions that presented themselves right away. So if we have the luxury of time, we were gonna make every effort to send out this notification to you customer, there, we may look in, we're looking at de-energizing in the next one to four hours, but again, the conditions at that time will determine whether we're able to send this information in time or not. Another common question I receive from customers is, okay, Luis, I get it, you shut off our power, it's for safety purposes, you, there was a whole process on decision-making, got it. You shut off my power to my business, how soon will you restore power now, right? So what happens behind the scenes? So, let me pull the veil uh, back on that a little bit. So, and we actually have a communication that we go, that will be sent out to you that's called a preparing to re-energize notification. So again, to pull back the veil, if we've shut off power to a high fire risk area circuit or power is de-energized because of a tree falling onto a branch or someone's you know, backyard umbrella blew over onto a circuit that is in a high fire risk area, we cannot just simply restore power just because it's safe to do so. In other words, we need to confirm and verify that it's safe to restore power to that circuit or that circuit segment. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna go out to that, say circuit breaker, from that circuit breaker to pulse switch one, two, three, make sure that it's safe to restore power. In other words, we need to ensure that every pole that's supposed to be there is still standing, that every wire that's supposed to be there is still strong, and more importantly, that we don't have any trees or any debris or anything toppled or entangled into our equipment where if we were to reintroduce power, it would create an additional hazard to that community. So once that section of circuit has been deemed safe, then we will restore power. Now we're gonna continue for every segment until the entire circuit or the entire area has been fully restored safely. Now, yes, it's a slow methodical approach, 
but it is the safest way for us to restore power without introducing an additional hazard to that community. And that's what this communication is intended to let you know, customer, we're beginning that process to patrol, to inspect that section of the line, to ensure that it's safe to restore power to your business, to your home, okay? Now, again, I wanna mention it one more time, and I've heard, you've already heard this from me at least 1,500 times today. Please help us ensure that we have your updated contact information at all times, okay? Just wanna re reiterate that one more time. So next slide. So sometimes during these PSPS events, <clears throat> I've heard from my customers say, hey, listen, please, I lost power. I have no power in my business, but literally across the street, that's Starbucks, that 7-Eleven or whatever it is, they have power. What's going on? Can't you just run a, you know, an extension cord to that circuit and restore my power? Right, so it's really not that simple. And we wanted to provide this visual to give you more information on how that could be. So it could be that maybe in your business area, <clears throat> there are no poles, everything is underground. But the threat area is a few miles upstream from you that maybe runs through a mountainous location. And that's where the, th the, the, the main threat is for your circuitry. So we're looking to de-energize that circuitry, okay? To protect everything downstream and that potential threat up there. Now, with our different mitigations that have been deployed, we are now looking at different opportunities to properly switch customers out of de-energized to neighboring circuits, okay? And that will continue. We do have some plans set in place. There are different factors out of time that will be considered. In other words, let's say that your business area has been de-energized and that other neighboring business park literally across the street couldn't have power. But if we were to switch you and connect you to that neighboring circuit, maybe there's not enough load. And if we were to shift the load, we would blow all the circuitry. So all of these factors will come into play uh, at, you know, when, when the PSPS uh, events begin to materialize and it's all under consideration. But a lot of the mitigation efforts that have been deployed and will continue to be deployed are specifically for that is to reduce the scope of these impacts to you and your operations. So let's go ahead and move over to our next slide because there are many opportunities for customers uh, for, for self-generation uh, incentive programs to help you uh, kind of mitigate your own in impacts of de-energizing events. <clears throat> so for those customers, uh, there is a self-JIP or self-JIP program to help cover costs for qualifying businesses to install energy storage systems. There are some qualifications to it. You have to be located in a tier two or tier three high fire risk area. It must uh, be a critical facility or critical infrastructure provider. What does that mean? You may provide some emergency services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera communications, medical facilities, natural gas, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole list of things that you may qualify uh, for the SGIP program. Uh, and, uh, but there's more information for you. In fact, I would recommend that you reach out to the SGIP group uh, that they can provide you more information to see whether your business qualifies for this self-generation uh, incentive program. Now, again, there's no need to commit this to memory. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a PDF version of this presentation, and it will be disseminated to this membership so you have this information with you. So no need to commit this to memory just yet. So in our next slide, I want to cover just something very, very simple for our customers, just continuing information, continue to stay informed and engage with uh, wildfire information. Number one, always stay informed. We have... Um, we are developing, continuing to improve our, our SCE.com website, our landing page for wildfire information. Uh, it has just gone through a new revamp and more information will be available to you. So please become familiar with that landing page. It was probably going to be the first place you look for for more information and details. As always, let's ensure that we have your updated contact information so that during these emergency events, we're able to deliver proper information to those contacts within your operations. And as always, be prepared. Let's ensure that your business has started to incorporate business resiliency opportunities for events where you lose power for one hour, four hours, 24 hours. What would that look like for your own operations? And if you have that already built into your own business resiliency plan, exercise those plans as often as possible. So let's move over to the next slide. Um, uh, I'm gonna include this slide here that has more information and resources on how to just grow your own situational awareness capabilities, grow that preparedness ability for your own operations. Um, if you need more information on vegetation management, there's perhaps a tree that's kind of growing into some uh, overhead equipment. I'm gonna provide this information to you. So no need to commit this to memory, more is coming on its way, okay? Now, one of the things that a uh, common question I do receive from customers is will Edison provide a generator? So let's move over to the next slide. 
uh, please. So as a business practice, Edison will not provide a backup generator, particularly during these emergency events. If there's an opportunity where it's going to be a longer or larger scope, then there may be that opportunity to energize a larger swath of customers. However, in the meantime, we want to encourage our customers to begin thinking about what does backup generation mean for your own business. And you can go to se.com under Outage Center. Uh, let's do one more click. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, uh, you'll see a little section that under related links that says find a generator. Once you click on that, uh, let's move to the next one. A third window will pop up. It will take you to a third party where you can begin your research on your, on your own for your own business for backup generation procurement. Now, we're not going to recommend a specific generating, uh, you know, generation company or a uh, specific type of equipment or anything like that. That's not what we're going to do. Uh, but this is a resource to help you begin that uh, generation procurement for your own operations. So let's go ahead and move over to the next slide. I think we're running out of time. Now, one thing I want to highlight in the next slide is on really business resiliency uh, elements of your own plan. Okay. So let's go ahead. There we go. One more slide. Again, a lot of information to, uh, on, on this slide. I'm not going to cover it all. There's a couple of things I do want to highlight for you. As you begin to, get to, to start thinking about preparedness for your own operations, we want you to start identifying what that critical load uh, and need for backup generation is within your own operations. It could very well be that, let's say you have uh, a couple of locations, right, multiple sites. Are all sites critical? Perhaps for, oper for business purposes, but if you're business must lose power for any duration of time. What is that one facility, that meter, that one meter that if we lose power, this is gonna be a significant major impact to your operations. And that's where we want you to start growing your own situational awareness capabilities to identify, yes, this is that one meter, this is that one facility that I need to start thinking about deploying backup uh, generation or additional efforts to support that particular area, okay? Uh, as always, test and, and grow your own business resiliency plan as often as possible. Another recommendation for you is we want you to develop your internal and external communication templates and processes so that if you do lose power for any significant amount of time, you're able to engage with staff and your own downstream customers in real time provide updates, information, and, and status updates on your, on your own. Now, I mentioned a lot on Edison pushing out information to you, so always keep your uh, contact information updated, but you can always push in to Edison to get more information, and I'll get, cover that a little bit more in a few more slides. So let's go over to the next slide. I decided to add a couple of slides here for you just to develop your own outage preparedness kit. What does that mean for you? Next slide, uh, is it, there's a downloadable emergency preparedness guide for you. I'm adding that here and, 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 a, and a pathway to finding that information. And in the next step, I added another slide for food safety tips. This is a common question that I do receive from many of our customers. So I wanted to just add it here as a side note, just for more informational purposes. Now in the next slide, and I know I'm running out of time, so I wanna to get to this pretty quickly on our communication resources. Okay, our next slide. So during these emergency events, what do you do? Edison is pushing on a lot of information to you, uh, but how do I grow my own situation, situational awareness capabilities if I am not able to reach out, reach out to anyone? So number one, your place to look for is SCE.com. There's a lot of self-service opportunities there for you, but let's say there you need more detailed information, a more detailed analysis of the PSPS event or an upcoming maintenance outages or a live outage event that's impacting you right now. Well, the outage communications team was created to serve all of our commercial and government customers in this space. So you can reach out to us at seoutage at se.com for any information related to any outage event, including PSPS events, okay? Uh, I'm also adding our phone number here, but I do want to redirect you from our phone number to our email address. The email allows us a greater flexibility to respond to our customers, to triage customers, right? So let's say you have an incoming inquiry on a live outage that's impacting your business, right? Giving us a call is great. It'll, it'll be answered by this machine and we'll begin to triage it then. However, if it comes in an email, we're able to more easily process and reassign it and have it deployed to one of our, our team members so they can respond to you as quickly as possible. So again, I want to encourage you, allow us the opportunity to serve you in this outage space and information by using seoutage at sce.com. Now, one caveat, this email address is not for residential use. This is not for your home. This is not for, you know, your aunt's house, you know, lost power. 
this is strictly for commercial and government customers only. Okay, just want to re reiterate that to you, strictly for commercial and government information only. If you send us a request for outage on a residential, we're going to return it back to you. It will not be addressed. Again, SEE outage at SEE.com is strictly for commercial and government support. So this is what we're here for and, and uh, to provide that level of information to you. Now, if you reach out to our customer contact center, our call center, those folks do a great job at what they do. It's a magnificent job. However, if your business needs more detailed information, a more in-depth analysis of that outage, that's what our team is here for. And that's where you can reach out to us, seoutage at sce.com. Now, I know I've gone through a lot of information and you may have some certain questions. Let me just take a step back and throw it back to our team. Do we have any questions? Yes, By the way, do. I'm your favorite Edison person to or punching bag from Edison. So let's bring on your questions. We have a few questions from the audience, starting with how does the loss of power affect, affect your home or business if you have solar? Great question. So one of the, uh, it, it's a common thing where many customers that, you know, have solar panels. In fact, we have solar panels at, at our house. The solar panels, uh, unless your solar panels are feeding a local backup system in your home, and if you lose power at home, your, your home switches to that backup system, that you will not, power will not come on for you, okay? It's connected directly to the grid. So if, if you want that solar system to power your home during an emergency event, then you will need to have your own in-house kind of backup storage system, okay? That's a good question. Louise, we have a few more questions. As a small sure. business owner, I know the impact of shutoffs. Is there anything else that I can do to prepare? Sure. Uh, one of the major things I could tell our customers is to grow your own situation awareness capabilities. Become aware of what is happening around you. If there's a, an elevated uh, wind threat or you know, weather threat in your area, become aware of that and begin incorporating those potential threats into your own operations. What does that mean for you? If I have significant winds coming through in the next couple of days, in the next week or so, how can I start preparing now in advance of that threat? How can I begin engaging my downstream customers as well as my staff to prepare for that potential de-energizing event? And if I have some critical service or, um, or need, uh, do I need to, uh, to bring in backup generation for that specific site, that specific meter that cannot go down? Because if that site loses power, then I lose X amount of dollars in materials, X amount of dollars in food. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So really grow the situational awareness capabilities, not just outside of what's impacting you, but how your own operations work and how you can shore that up in case you lose power. It may not necessarily occur because Edison practically shuts off power, but it could be a truck backed up into a pole, you know, further upstream from you, and now we have no power. Okay, so just to kind of grow that awareness. Thank you, Louise. We have a few more questions. Sure. Our certificate. Sure credit going to be issued? I'm assuming this is with um, either solar energy or a different topic that you've discussed. Are certificates for credit going to be issued? Are certificates for credit going to be issued? Um, this is really, it's a question kind of outside the scope of our conversation today. Uh, so if I were to give you any answer, I honestly would be lying to you. Okay. And I don't want to do that. So it's kind of outside the scope of our conversation today, but if you need more specific information on that, uh, e email me at seoutage at sc.com. I can take that as a parallel question and route you to the proper folks. I don't want to lie to you. Thank you, Louise. Next question. Can you repeat the difference between red flag warning versus no power? Oh, okay, good. So let's say that um, the National Weather Service has issued a red flag warning. So just because a red flag warning has been issued for your community, for your region, it doesn't mean that we're going to shut off power to your region, okay? Uh, it only means that Edison is gonna focus our attention in that particular region where the red flag warning has been issued, okay? So red flag warning does not equal no power. It does equal our Edison's focused attention in that particular region. Now, again, just to kind of highlight, when a red flag warning has been issued in your area, this is typically because there's higher wind speeds in that particular region. So we may not de-energize you because of a proactive 
effort. It may be because of tree branches or palm fronds or debris blowing into equipment that may shut off power or interrupt power to your operations. But good question as part of building your own awareness of what is happening around you. Thank you for that question. All right, next question. question. Can you remind us on how to update our contact information? My mother speaks Spanish. Are the notifications in Spanish as well? Or is there any opportunity for Spanish? Please help. Great question. Uh, as part of our end-to-end -end analysis of our communications with our customers, we are deploying multi-language uh, opportunities for customers. So that is coming, that should be deployed already in this month, actually, uh, multiple languages. So we want to encourage all of our customers, you can, you can call um, our 800 number. In fact, when you receive this uh, presentation in a PDF format, there's a couple of slides in there that will show you how to get in there into se.com and update your own contact information. So you can do that uh, through my account on se.com. You can reach out to the call center. They'll be more than happy to do that for you. But yes, in-language services are, are coming and have been deployed. Great question. All right, Louise, to wrap up the session, we have a question from an audience member regards to Louise. What are your words of wisdom to stay prepared and be agile? Um, just closing thoughts, please. On preparedness and agility, I think the, the best thing I can recommend to all of our customers is to really become aware of what is happening around you. Um, I know that a lot of the interactions that you have with Edison uh, typically really boil down to two things. One, when you have to pay the bill, and two, when you flip the switch and the light doesn't come on. In both instances, they're not necessarily the best engagement opportunities with Edison. So how do you grow that opportunity? How do you grow that communication with Edison that's already not really in the best light with you, but how can we grow that partnership with you? How do we grow that ebb and flow of communication with you so that during these emergency events and hopefully in advance of the emergency events, we're able to engage with you, deliver the information that you need so that when you receive the information from Edison, you have already grown that situational awareness capabilities. And I know I keep saying this a lot because it really helps to underscore how important it is uh, to really be aware of what is happening around you and how you can uh, respond to those you know, unexpected events more uh, with more agility or more flexibility, right? So really, it's really becoming aware, engaging Edison, not just when you have to pay the bill, but really, hey guys, I see a potential threat coming down. I, I heard that there's some significant wins. Uh, Outage team, what, can, what information can you tell me about that? Do I need to prepare? What do I need to do, et cetera, et cetera. So let's begin the engagement process with Edison a lot earlier, and let's grow this partnership. Another caveat to that, um, as we're not just business customers, we're also families, right? We have friends and family and people that we know that may have a heightened medical need. Uh, as a community, let's ensure that we have those, uh, those persons that have a heightened medical need um, really aware that Hey guys, you know what? You should let Edison know because during an emergency event, they do take additional steps uh, to ensure that you're aware of the potential impacts in your community. So let's move it from, it's a business and that's great. There's a, there's a, there's a greater opportunity there for us to engage and, and grow our partnership, but also how do I, how do I incorporate all that in, uh, emergency preparedness information into my own home, into my own family? So I hope that helps. Thank you, Louise. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our presentation with Southern California Edison in regards to business resiliency and also recovery. If you should have any questions, please reach out to the two points of contact or the icons you see on the screen. We thank you for your time. And Louise, thank you for your presentation. We appreciate you all. Have a wonderful morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.